We had plans also to do like rounds of conferences about, about Beirut, about some cultural aspects of Beirut. And so Levant as a tour operator, uh, was transformed into Levant as a cultural space. So we went from pastry shop and tours to coffee and, uh, and culture. And so this is how, what like the initial vision I had for Levant and then what it became and it might even evolve in the future. This episode is proudly brought to you by Mapper Forwards Workshop. It's time to become a coffee consultant. Learn how to diversify your revenue streams and create freedom from your day job while saying goodbye to that alarm clock forever by becoming a consultant within the coffee industry or directly to consumers who have shifted towards home brewing and home roasting. Protect your income from challenging times in the coffee value chain by taking this course today. Go to mapperforward.coffee forward slash workshops or click the link in the show notes for details. Welcome to the Daily Coffee Pro by Map It Forward, friends. I'm your host, Lee Safar, and this is unfortunately episode five, the last episode of a five-part series with Joseph Sayer from Levant Cafe in Beirut, Lebanon. As we've been saying in the last four episodes, Beirut is still uh, in a war in wartime, and we hope, we deeply hope that that happens to come ha- comes to an end very very quickly uh, for both the people in in Lebanon and the people in Gaza in in Palestine um, and I will never apologize to the people who send me DMs on social media telling me that I shouldn't be talking like this I will never apologize for having this position you're wasting your breath trying to change my mind when a business owner like Joseph approaches, um, and makes a decision to keep his business open, as you were saying, Joseph. For you, this is uh, this is a kind of protest, and and it's a really great kind of um, decision to step into resiliency and cultivating grit and and all of the things that create tools for the rest of your life, not just for you as a business owner, and not just for Levant as a business, but for everybody that's involved in the business. With that comes a lot of disruption. And at the core of that disruption is comparing what your vision is when you started Levant to the the new vision that has to be reimagined for the brand, right? And undoubtedly, even though Lebanon had gone through a financial crisis and COVID and the explosion at the port, as you said in the first episode, there was a kind of normalcy that had been reached and things have changed for everybody in, in who has a business in Beirut. Shout out to Rana Hassani, who is the reason that you and I met, um, who also has a, a business, Edda uh, Coffee, Edda Arabica in, in Beirut. Um, but businesses like yours and businesses like Rana have to reimagine the, the strategy moving forward because of what's happened. How do you approach that as a business owner? How do you turn around and say, well, this is what we thought we were going to achieve in our five-year or 10-year vision. How does this situation make you reimagine that and how do you approach that? Yes, indeed. Uh, so many things have happened since I opened Laval um, in September 2023. And ever since I opened, I did have a, a vision or a plan, but it was never a five or a 10 year plan. And I think this is something also that uh, I learned from, you know, being a, a bit of an uncertain region, but also trying to be as lean as possible mm-hmm. for, a, um, for, a, for a coffee shop, I think. For what I wanted to achieve, uh, I didn't have a 10 year plan. I didn't even have a five year plan. I had a three year plan. Mm-hmm. And this allows me also to keep the flexibility. Sometimes mm-hmm. when you have a, a set vision, it gives you like a direction, but it also gives you like something to stick for uh, and it becomes difficult to pivot or t- to change a bit. So I was trying to have a plan, but also one that would be, wouldn't be rigid enough for, for me to, to steer from. Mm-hmm. So what I started with initially 
for me, it was Levant as a place that sells Lebanese pastries in Jamaisa, which is a neighborhood where I'm open mm -hmm. by the unit. And the target would be mainly expats who are walking in Jamaisa or tourists. And this was like truly the starting point. And for me, it was not just about the, the sweets, but as soon as I figured that, uh, this might not be enough for Levant because of, uh, the war starting, uh, and even before the war starting, I kind of quickly figured after like a few weeks that, uh, this will not be as, um, profitable as I thought it was going to be. Um, I had to think about it while, you know, like, um, building the ship while driving it. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, I started to have like a deeper vision for Levant and because there is like a different part of, uh, of me, of who I am, who's very interested and who truly loves Lebanon. I wanted Levant to be some sort of touristic speakeasy where like people would come for the desserts and and then they would end up um, booking a trip to mm -hmm. to Baalbek probably, or to uh, Saida or something like this. And for me, like what I wanted to achieve was Levant as a pastry shop and Levant as a tour operator. Right. But then the war happened. So when the war happened, um, People like there was no tourists anymore. So the Levant as a tour operator was something that wasn't gonna happen again anytime soon. Because even wow. if the had to stop tomorrow, I think it would take a lot Please. of time for people start coming back to do tourism in, in Beirut. So this is something, unfortunately, that is put on hold for the moment, at least for a medium term. And so I had to adapt and I had to change. And the first thing I changed was obviously to stop the tours that I was doing, uh, but also to, to, to start adapting to my new clientele, which wasn't expats and foreigners anymore, but it was more of locals and neighbors. So the first thing I did is to level up the coffee uh, and the tea offering at Levant. Mm. This is what really pushed me to invest in a, in a, in a coffee machine and the grinder, even though we were in times of crisis, this investment was crucial for the survival of Levant. And a year after it's, it's not even, it's haven't been even a year since I had my coffee machine, but even a few months later, uh, the coffee machine was making about 60 to 70% of my revenue. So, so it paid off. I, yes, it did pay off very wow, quickly. And great. So I, think I had made this investment. I think I couldn't have survived more than six months. So this was wow. like a for me to, to make, uh, and it did pay, pay off really well. And so today, um, today the image of, or like the, the, the view of Levant as a pastry shop and Levant as a tour operator doesn't exist in the short and medium term anymore. Mm -hmm. But what has replaced instead this vision is Levant as a coffee shop. And the other part where, which I thought about is the vision behind Levant as a tour operator was to share the history and the culture of, of Lebanon with mm -hmm. the expats and the tourists. And I thought about how can I share the history and the culture of Lebanon and with whom, because the expat and the tourists aren't here anymore. And this is how we started, um, doing events and gatherings at Levant, sharing our history and our culture, not with externals, but within ourselves. So this is how we started doing Arabic calligraphy workshops this is always started doing poetry gathering uh, sketching and drawing workshops. And this has evolved in, in different ways. We had plans also to do like rounds of conferences about, about Beirut, about some cultural aspects of Beirut. And so Levant as a tour operator, uh, was 
transformed into Levant as a cultural space. So we went from pastry shop and tours to coffee and, uh, and culture. And so this is how, what like the initial vision I had for Levant and then what it became and it might even evolve in the future. And is your approach to planning the same as your approach to, let's say, financing? So you, you run lean so that you can stay agile. And is your planning more short term so that you can be more adaptive to changing, um, changing consequences around you? And, and I guess, is that because of the war or is that because of the kind of business owner that you are? It's a bit of both. The kind of business owner who I am would plan more of a short to medium term. I would try to have a few weeks or maybe even a few months of, uh, um, of planning ahead. Mm -hmm. But in times of war, this window gets reduced so much. So it's very difficult to plan for what's going to happen in three or, or six months. So it really reduces you to, um, uh, the scale of a day or a week and according, or maybe just a month. So according to how intense the, uh, the, the war is, uh, this is how you reduce your planning. So for example, sometimes the strikes can intensify and then when they intensify during the day, I know that this is the end of my day. For example, if, if they strike Beirut at 3 p.m., after 3 p.m., I have zero customer entering the vault. Right. For, and, just for clarity, sorry, folks, when he talks about strikes, he's talking about missiles. He's not talking about, like, employee strikes. We're talking about yeah. Yeah, just, yeah. So if, if well, the strike happens at 3 o'clock, that's it. Nobody's coming out of their house, correct? End of day. So sometimes I had to close uh, much, much, much earlier than my... Uh, typical closing hour because mm. I know that this is the end of it, uh, end of day. So it reduces, even if I had, so, uh, in, there are some days where I had something planned for the evening and right. one cancels uh, by message. So you know that this is it. So you try to plan, but then the plan is always on hold, you know, uh, it, it can, it can be canceled anytime. So, which is why you have to plan. Uh, for things that, unfortunately, you can cancel last minute, um, everyone's understanding. So this is also the thing about times of crisis is that the customers and the people are more indulgent. So mm. it gives you the ability to also maybe take a certain type of risk because you know that whatever's going to happen, people will understand. So in, right. in normal time, if you cancel an event last minute, people will get frustrated. They're like, I planned my week accordingly and you just canceled on me. But then if you cancel something last minute in times of war, everyone is understanding. Yeah. So, uh, and it gives this sense of, of, you know, we're all in the same boat together. We're all in this mm -hmm. together. So if we needed to cancel for a certain reason, they will understand why we had to cancel. When the strikes uh, are less intense, sometimes there's a period of calm, for like two or three days, very intuitively, very naturally, you start planning on longer term, you know? Wow. These windows, they allow you to, to dream a bit more. Mm -hmm. And so start doing some deeper work. And this is also something that's a bit counterintuitive. Um, we were talking about this a bit earlier, is that in times of, in normal times, you gets sometimes uh, very dragged in the operations and very busy reacting to everything that you don't have planned to get things done for the longer term. Mm -hmm. Sometimes in times of crisis, when the time allows it, because in times of crisis, you, have, you go into survival mode, but then sometimes you have small windows mm -hmm. where um, you're not busy in operations, you're not busy in surviving, you do have free time. And you try to use that time to plan ahead and to do the mental exercise of, okay, I will try to do a planning for this month or for the coming two months, even though everything might 
everything is up in the air because it can be canceled anytime. Still, it's better to, to try to lay down a plan. And then the even more difficult mental exercise is to say, this crisis is temporary. This is going to finish at some point. Mm -hmm. So what the, for us after this, if I manage to survive this, what is the law after the crisis? And I think this is the most difficult part for most people during the crisis is to be able to understand um, that this is, this, it will eventually pass. And then what's after it? How do you, are you at the point where you can imagine a Levant after this crisis, or is that a luxury that you're waiting to be afforded? It's very difficult to think about this at the moment, mm -hmm. but sometimes I try to, um, to do this exercise. It doesn't come naturally, mm -hmm. but you kind of have to, uh, be intentional Dream. about it. Mm. Exactly. It's almost like a you know, a, a meditation that you're trying to do or a prayer, like you have to be intentional about it. It's like, mm -hmm. uh, you sit and you say, okay, let's imagine we've, uh, survived this and this is done, but you have no sure. idea if talking about the next month or six months or year or so, what, what does it mean for Ravon? And it does help a lot to think about this because mm -hmm. it also makes it a bit reality. Uh, even though like, you know, that this might be, this is a dream, but you need to dream because it keeps you going, it gives you energy and, you know, who knows if, if things go in the, in, in the right way, then, you know, the dream might, uh, become true. So Inshallah. you always like try doing it. The last thing I want to ask you about is risk appetite. Has your risk appetite changed since the business took a turn, since what happened in Gaza and then the escalation into Lebanon? Ha what's the, the relationship between you and your risk appetite? I think that um, I've always been kind of a risk taker. Mm. Uh, not a reckless one, but... Uh, I do jump calculated risks. I, people call it calculated risk. I, I call it strong intuition. Uh, so nice. I, when I feel I, I want to, there is something I feel like doing. I, I just do it. And I often found myself, uh, you know, swimming opposite of the, of the current. So I had, I left Lebanon when I was 17 to study in France. This was kind of a risk for a 17 year old teenager to go live mm. by his own coming from the culture where I come from. And then when I decided to move back to Beirut in, uh, around 2022, 2023, where the country was still going through a crisis, uh, this was also a, a risk that I had taken. And many people were actually fleeing uh, Lebanon at that time I was coming back. And so I'm not scared of risk. Um, I'm scared of like physical danger mm -hmm. that, that can happen, but still, um, the risk that you take is, as you said, is like when it's a calculated one, it means that every decision that you've made, you know, what are the consequences of it and you mm -hmm. accepted them. So you do the mental exercise of, uh, imagining, uh, you know, some of the, these are exercises that they usually do in in, in like some sort of behavioral therapy is like, mm. if you imagine what is the worst case scenario or what does it mean for you? And then you realize it's not as bad as it seems mm. are never, are never black or white. We always tend to imagine this as a complete loss and a complete damage. Uh, you do, uh, it's, it's never black or white. It's always gray. There is always something you take out of it. And I've had a, I've launched a previous company uh, at an earlier stage in my life where we were like selling boxes of Lebanese products abroad. It's like, it was like a subscri subscription box where every month you would subscribe mm. and get a piece of, of Lebanon wherever you are. And we couldn't make it profitable and we closed it. Uh, so in a way, seen from a financial perspective, maybe it was a fail, but it opened so many doors. It never it found. made me meet so many people. Uh, which I ended up working with now at, uh, with Levant, collaborating, 
uh, brands I've collaborated with uh, again or or people who I'm working with at the moment. So it always takes you somewhere else and everything always end up making sense retrospectively. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that's why, you know, um, I think you regret more the chances or the things that you didn't do than the things that you've done. And this is how yeah. I, I go about it. I'm deeply grateful for this conversation. It, in in a world that seems like it is um, very confusing right now, conversations like this are not confusing to me at all. Conversations like this help me have hope for the future of humanity. Let's just say that, but more so for our industry. So thank you for coming on here and having this very real, um, very uh, vulnerable but authentic conversation. Um, and I look forward to the opportunity to have you back on the podcast, Joseph. Thank you so much, Lee, for um, receiving me on the podcast for this discussion. Um, and uh, yeah, peace, love, and you know, butter. Have an amazing rest of your day, everyone. See you later. Bye. I really hope you enjoyed this episode, friends. Please don't forget to show us some love by subscribing, liking, commenting, and most of all, sharing this podcast with your friends. Check the show notes for links, including our sponsors and our Patreon, and stay tuned for more great conversations on the Daily Coffee Pro by Mapper Forward.